Before we resume our look at the Daleks Master Plan, we've probably lost all our audience during our extended break, so I just wanted to say at the top, if you enjoy this episode, please let others know about it by leaving us a good review on Apple Podcasts, sharing it on social media, and engaging with our social media on Twitter and Facebook. The links are in the blurb. We've also taken the plunge on Patreon, where you can get early access and access to all sorts of missing episode ramblings. The next episode, The Massacre, is there right now, and you can find us at www.patreon.com slash missing episodes. And on that note, let me say a huge thank you to our mighty Kublai Khan patrons, Tony Carroll, Bedwia Gulich, Jess Jerkovic, Paul Cook, Ray Badrick, Simon Whitehead, Tim Arding and Unknown Consciousness. Your support and indeed the support of all of our patrons is deeply appreciated. Anyway, that's enough of me harping on. Now onwards with our deep dive into the missing episodes of The Daleks Master Plan. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Missing Episodes podcast. Like 2013's Marco Polo, we've been fished off a dusty shelf and are back and iTunes ready. <laughs> well, what's it called? <coughs> Apple Podcast ready. Um, no sketch, but I thought I'd do a, a bit of omni humour. Very good. Very hey? good. Nice. I, re I, re I replaced the R with H. So we've got no Paul this episode as he's off to Uranus to mine a full M of Terranium. Hopefully he'll be back in time to discuss the massacre and we might even do one of our hilarious trademark opening sketches. But instead we are joined once again by graphic designer, Doctor Who magazine contributor, Dalek expert and co-creator of Terry Nation Army, Gavin Rymill. Hello Gav. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Again. Welcome back. You've gone, you've gone grey since we recorded the last episode. I know, I know. The eye makeup works as well, doesn't it? And for the first time on the Missing Episodes podcast, we're joined by another Doctor Who magazine contributor and Doctor Who researcher extraordinaire, Rhys Williams. Hello, Rhys. Welcome. Hello. I'm looking forward to the only episode of the Missing Episodes podcast that I won't listen to umpteen <laughs> times. <laughs> oh bless later on we'll be joined by doctor who broadcast history and all around missing episodes boffin john preddle who i spoke to a little while back so we'll play in his input as required and when necessary but great to have uh, an opportunity to talk to john again too so reese yes I've, I've known you for a little while uh you seem relatively obsessed with black and white Doctor Who and missing episodes. How, how come? You could say that. How come? What got you into the missing episodes? Well, it's a bit of a roundabout story. When I was growing up, not many of my peer group knew about Doctor Who. The program was off the air, at a low ebb in the public mm. consciousness. But my mate Dave, his older brother, was a massive Doctor Who fan. And one day, Dave told me that his brother had every single Doctor Who VHS. Ah. I was incredulous, of course. I only had about 10 <laughs> stories at that time. So uh, I went round to Dave's house and he uh, showed me inside his brother's room. And sure enough, there was this towering bookshelf, floor to ceiling, crammed with all these videos. Ah. And because this outrageous claim of Dave's brother needed verifying, evidently, I brought along my souvenir brochure from the Langothlin Doctor Who exhibition, which had a list of every story. And so I whipped this out and started making my way along the shelves. And I said, hold on, he hasn't got this one. He hasn't got this one. <laughs> and Dave said, oh, those, those ones don't exist. They, they haven't been released on video. You can't get them. But look, he has got the legendary unfinished story Sharda. Look at that. So I don't think the... I don't think the loss of the stories really 
had much of an impact on me at that time. It wasn't until the 2011 returns that I really got invested in the whole mm. missing episode side of things. But I do remember that uh, the Lost in Time DVD set was one of my favourites, and mm. I really enjoyed it as a sort of pick-and-mix variety pack for all these wildly different episodes yeah. from the 1960s, among which, of course, are those three slices of the Daleks' master plan. Indeed, yeah. Gav and I, who are a bit older, we had the we had the Hartnell years and the Troughton years, which also had that pick-and-mix selection of episodes, and it's the same with Lost in Time, and they're incredibly cruel watches <laughs> because you're watching this live, vibrant uh, footage for 25 minutes, and then you can't f***ing watch the next one. It was the uh, Daleks, the early years tape that had yes, the two episodes yeah. of Master Plan on. And uh, lodged in my head is Peter Davison's introduction, scripted by John Nathan Turner, which has the uh, voiceover of Roy Skelton saying exterminate, and Peter Davison pretending he's doing the voice. And he says, those words relentlessly extolling the virtues of extermination, <laughs> <laughs> which they're not doing. But, uh, but it's interesting that Master Plan being this kind of weird serial that pinballs around the place was so much easier to enjoy as two isolated episodes than many other things. Uh, you know, it, it's often been said that Enemy of the World's reputation improved when it was found because the existing episode in isolation was a continuation of, of threads and characters that you knew nothing about. And although that's largely true of Master Plan, it's, it's sort of a weekly space adventure feel means that those two episodes that existed at the time didn't connect to each other, for one thing. So you didn't worry too much about what all the other episodes were doing that didn't connect to the two that we could see, and you could mm. enjoy them isolated. You probably couldn't ask for a, a better spread of recovered episodes over the story. Mm. There's something completely different in each mm. of them. Sure. Anyway, more on that sort of thing later, I guess. Gavin! Hi. I've noticed that since your last appearance, you've snuck into the old podcast game yourself. Tell us about that. I have. Well, we wanted to get some supplementary content put out there and thought that uh, a regular, quickly produced podcast episode would be a nice sort of holdover until we get some of these new YouTube videos out. But the podcast episodes are extremely painful to do as well extremely <laughs> time consuming tell me about it <laughs> and uh so they're just delaying the videos coming out <laughs> even further but yeah i've got a couple of podcast ideas lined up and about half a dozen video episodes of terry nation army lined up if you haven't heard the podcast it's episode two i think um gav reese uh rob ritchie talk about some of the work they did for the evil of the daleks animation which is utterly fascinating and how they they researched and reconstructed the tricolor cafe in episode one and a few other bits and, and that was absolutely fascinating and you've both been working with simon Garrier in doctor who magazine on recreating sets and discussing those for what have you done so far the moon base yeah, we've done the Moon Base, Visa Steven, the Macro Terra, Tenth Planet Four, some big hitters. And Wheel in Space One was our most recent. Yes. How could I forget? Utterly amazing, superb graphic designs by Gav of the sets, uh, with research from Reese, and then, and then some printed words by Reese and Simon. How did that come about? Well, can I can I just say first of all, it did initially start out with me doing three D modeling and illustrating and Reese uh, mm. co-writing. But Reese has just casually been learning 3D modeling with his <laughs> eyes closed and his one hand behind his back. And for the Wheel in Space feature, he did most of the modeling of that set and I just turned up at the end and added some textures and lighting and dropped the servo robot in the TARDIS. Well, it's, it's, it is amazing. It's become a real collaboration where we're all chipping in what we can and what, what needs to be there for each each article and so um on the first one the feast of stephen gav and i spent a lot of time really getting into the nitty-gritty of you know what what we thought we were seeing in the photographic evidence and what what we thought there might be in the the places that weren't covered by photos 
So it's, it's Feast of Stephen and Wheel in Space 1. There's no studio floor plans that exist. So you've recreated them from <laughs> interpretation of the sparse number of photographs that exist in telesnaps. Mm. And it's utterly astounding. Thank you. We were really lucky with, uh, with the Feast of Stephen because the only reason we have so many photos for that episode is that Jean Marsh had her first appearance in episode four um, was being broadcast that same week that the Feast of Stephen was recorded. So there was a press photo call arranged uh, because it was her first first episode being broadcast. So if she had first appeared in episode three, we wouldn't have had any of these photos from the Feast of Stephen. Sure. And they're really nice because it's her mainly being shot on the the Hollywood set, which features the sawmill. But bizarrely, the camera is situated in the set, shooting out off the set, which is perfect because we get images of the TARDIS set in the background, which allowed us to triangulate where at least two of the main sets within the studio floor space. And then we use other photos to sort of triangulate bits and fill in the gaps and um, asking for people's recollections mm. to try to work out the police station for which there's no visuals whatsoever. Um, mm. The Wheel in Space has been really fun, although weirdly I've kind of got more into it since we finished the article because I took Reese's model and started dropping in cameras uh, and trying to work out where some of the camera positions would have been based on the comments in the camera script and where the sets end and things like that. Uh, and I started to get a bit obsessed with trying to work out the exact appearance of the camera shots. Uh, in terms of where the actors would have had to have been standing and would have had to have moved to. So, mm. you know, one day, maybe perfectly accurate, complete wheel in space one as per the camera script could be created. Mm. Yeah, the, the camera script and the floor plan together really are the blueprint for creating the episode. So when you, if you have both, then you can imagine pretty closely what would have been recorded. And we're actually, we're quite lucky for the Daleks master plan, we do have most of the episodes uh, as floor plans. Amazing. Last episode we discussed how it's a very visual story Dalek's master plan and that makes it all the crueler for being three quarters missing so we invited listeners to comment on various social media platforms so I'll, I'll, I'll read through some of those comments and then we've totted up the number of references uh, to various scenes and we'll reverse order those to do some sort of countdown to the most missed missing bit of Dalek's master plan and we'll see how we get on and hopefully Gavin Reese you can you can shine some light on how these things might have been realized or what they might have looked like or how they did them anyway here we go james bell said i would love to see episodes 1 4 and 12 episode 1 as it sets up the epic saga and the surviving audio suggests atmosphere and tension in those jungle scenes set on kemble episode 4 as it's katarina's final episode and i'm curious to see how it looked if you go back to our previous episode gav talks about some trampoline death acting Mm. Alex Pass said it would be great to actually see something of the Screamers from episode 3, Devil's Planet. Mm, yeah. And how horrific was the aging to death of poor Sarah Kingdom? Definitely those final moments when the time destructor wreaks havoc. Just how did those Daleks disintegrate? Patrick Furlong, I'd love to see the full Katarina death scene with her floating in space. More of the meddling monk and a lot of the final episode. And maybe the infamous Christmas greeting. If you want to know a little bit more about that, check out Gav's volcano 
episode of his podcast. Lisa P and Andrew T from the Round the Archive podcast. The police station scenes hold a special fascination for us as it's an interesting and mostly missing, of course, period for Z cars on the point of mutating into softly softly. Ruben Herfindahl says the Keystone Cops bit from Feast of Stephen. I can never get enough of silly who. Andy Taylor, Brett Vion being killed, the Time Destructor sequence, and anything from Feast of Stephen just because it's all a bit nuts. <laughs> Daniel Glauser, who played the Professor in Episode 7? Was it Hartnell or an unknown actor? Who did play the Professor in Episode 7, chaps? It was Albert Barrington, who we believe was just an extra who specialised in old man walk-on parts. Oh. I think um, he was used by Camfield in an episode of Zed Cars. Oh, amazing. So even though it seems as though there is some punchline there that we're missing, it just seems to have been some random old bloke. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wondered if they if he looked, if he was dressed similar to Hartnell. That was, that was the joke. Well. Maybe a long white wig. Could be. They did have a, uh, a duplicate first Doctor costume mm. from the chase. So perhaps they pulled that out of the cupboard. Really, it should have been Edmund Warwick. <laughs> yes, the, uh, now that would have been another the professor joke. That would have been a good meta joke. <laughs> I, I need to go back to my Feast of Stephen YouTube video and edit out the bit where I claim that there is no evidence of the existence of that actor because it was relatively true at the time <laughs> and Toby had checked at the time. But since then, even more extensive checking has been done and he's been located. So, uh, yeah, so I need to trim that out and make it look like I never make a mistake. Unfortunately... That episode of Zed Cars is also missing, so we're none the wiser about just. Oh. Uh, Reese Hollow, I think more of Peter Butterworth's monk, Nick Courtney's first appearance, and then just for fun, the Doctor wishing us all a happy Christmas. Mark Hevingham, everyone likes the sound of that last episode. I would like to see the Feast of Stephen for its unique approach and that end. Mantaric on Twitter, hello Martin. Uh, where the TARDIS materializes at the test match and the death of Sarah Kingdom. Hmm. Andrew said anything from the cricket match, Stephen's reaction to Katarina's death, the first appearance of the monk, Stephen's reaction to Sarah's death, and Chen's realization that he's screwed. Excellent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Joe Siegler. I'd like to see if Salation's body language matches the really whiny tone he has uh, that's apparent on the recons. Also, Sarah's death. Salation's actor's in the arc, and he's pretty whiny there. Oh, who is it? Who is he in the arc? He's the sort of cowardly traitor person. I can't remember his name. Chaz of Ferrum. I'd like to see more of Peter Butterworth's meddling monk. Johnny Morris, the bit where they change the appearance of the monk's TARDIS. Yes, me too. As well as the obvious, Katarina floating away in space, Sarah Kingdom aging to death. Paul W, episode 12 in its entirety. I'd also like to see what the deal is with the Doctor in episode 11. Is Hartnell absent entirely with a double and a voiceover, or is he on screen for a short time? Do we see him wander off, or does he disappear off screen? Well, we know he was there. He was just yeah, mysteriously was absent for, for most of it. <laughs> well, it was his birthday the next day, so I think they just let him go home early. Uh, Tim Worthington, which delegates are in the cell in the abandoned planet? It's nice, it's nice to imagine that Sentriel might be there, but we, we have He's a not. costume requirement sheet and that lists which delegates were going to be there. Oh, go on. So it's just the ones you'd expect. Ah. They dropped Sentriel because his costume was a pain, mm. so... Ah. He's not in Master Plan full stop. Although there is, there is a minor mystery around delegates there in that the running order lists one more delegate than there should be in those scenes. So the running order says four delegates when there should be three and then once one is killed the running order says three when there should be two so don't know what that's about hmm. Hmm. mj fault certainly sarah's demise would be interesting gosh how grim of us but also seeing how stephen and the doctor play out their reaction to her death at the end here here in fact to see how they react to the end of the whole grim affair stephen walterstorff the end sequence with the doctor and sarah running with the time destructor curious how these effects played out rich tipple hello rich episode 12 is for me the greatest 25 minutes in doctor who's history 
We've been taken on the most epic of adventures, lost so many friends, battled so many foes, visited so many strange and distant worlds, and yet it comes down to this. Oh, to be able to watch it. 42 to Doomsday. Hello, Mark. Episode 12 in its entirety. Jonathan Lum, The Destruction of Time. Never have missing visuals been so essential. James Burgess. Hello, James. My dad's earliest memory of who was seeing a legion of Daleks blown up in the mid-60s. We reckon it was probably Power of the Daleks, but for that reason, I'd love to see how the carnage from Master Plan 12 compares. The Watcher, 1963. Hello, mate. Uh, Marvick Chen getting exterminated. He must look shocked. David G. Hello, David. David has a superb video on his YouTube of the making of a toasted cheese sandwich to the theme of Space 1999. <laughs> <laughs> the destruction of time, all of it. Something about that episode soundtrack just sounds suitably epic. It's as if they knew that after 11 weeks it had to be big, bold and dramatic. Stephen Glancy, hello Stephen. Probably the last minutes with the demise of Sarah Kingdom would be the scene I would like to see if it was possible. Thanks again for your excellent podcast. I eagerly await each episode. Gosh, you've been eagerly awaiting a while. <laughs> Bedwear Gulledge, I would love to see the look on Malvik Chen's face when the Daleks exterminate him. My best guess is that it's an expression of incredulity. Also, I'm curious how the cricket sequence was delivered on screen. The Andrew of Fenric, it has to be the climax to episode 12, the death of Sarah and the time destructor ravaging the planet Kemble. I long to see Hartnell's visceral screaming at Stephen, get back to the ship, get mm. back. Mm. The surviving audio is laden with atmosphere. Imagine how Camfield made it look. And Gavrimel simply said nipples, which I think he covered in <laughs> <laughs> the previous episode. Not only his own nipples, but he also talked about Nicholas Courtney's. The Human Palindrome. That's the lovely Mark from All of Time and Space podcast. As it's probably the least likely episode to ever be returned, I think it would be fascinating to see the Feast of Stephen. But most of all, I'd like to see the Doctor Stephen and Sarah trying to escape from the Time Destructor and ultimately Sarah's demise. Thanks so much for all your comments. So, we'll look at all of these perhaps in a little bit more detail and in reverse order. So, with two votes, the test match in Volcano. Huh. It's it's funny, people get a little bit preoccupied with this test match. We've seen the studio layout photographed from the gallery, and you can see that the cricket commentator's box is, is just a, a desk and a bit of backdrop. But I was looking at the camera script to try to work out exactly what this looked like, and it's done through a mix of stock footage, pre-filming, photo captions, and studio work. So it's a nice blend of disciplines to create this illusion. So it starts with stock footage and that's scripted as being a test match with Australia yeah. uh, and you get the voiceover from the character of Trevor over the top of that test match footage and then it cuts to the studio videotaping done on the night. It's a low two shot of Trevor and Scott on a 35 degree lens if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Um, then it cuts to pre-filmed material featuring the scoreboard. So BBC Graphics were asked to prep a scorecard image based on a stock photo. And they were asked to crop out the heads of the people in the photo and blow it up to 16 inches by 20 inches, about half a metre wide. BBC Graphics were given like a green outline to show the crop area and a black outline to show where transparency would fit over the top of it. Um, oh, the original photo included a... Uh, it was described as a closed slide door, which had to be retouched to appear open. Uh, as a as a cricket aficionado, does that mean anything to you, Tim? Yeah. So cricket scoreboards have a, a window so that the the people working the mechanical elements inside can watch the cricket or signal the umpire or whatever. Ah, and sometimes okay. reach nice. out, depending on the nature of the scoreboard. They sometimes have to reach out if it's an old fashioned one and hang new signs on the board nice right so that that makes sense so over the top of the scoreboard we hear the tardis sound effect and the commentators talking about mm. it so tardis landings all off camera and then the next shot is a photo caption of the tardis on grass i believe that's a miniature and that was taken on location. Can you remember where the location was, Reese? I think it was Hammersmith Park. That's it. There's, yeah. uh, there's a letter asking for permission to take some photos. Right. So you've got uh, the miniature TARDIS on location, Hammersmith Park. A photograph was printed and they had camera four just looking at that 
photo live, quote unquote live, on uh, on the night. Uh, then returns to studio for the hilarious banter. Now, to film the commentators in the box, they utilize cameras three and five, right? And then the commentators notice the sound of the TARDIS taking off again. Camera five goes for a close-up on Scott, at which point camera three hastily moves to where another photo caption is positioned. We then cut back to camera four, which is still pointing at the photograph of the model TARDIS in Hammersmith. But then the shot is mixed by vision mixer John Lopes to camera three, which has just moved and taken up its new position, pointing to a second photograph of the empty grass park at Hammersmith. Ah. So that dematerialization is achieved using a dissolve between two photos on separate cameras, essentially live, not live, but shot on the night without a break. And so given how quickly camera three has to move to find its spot, I imagine they wouldn't have got particularly <laughs> good alignment between the before and after photos, mm. as often happened in Doctor Who. So I suspect when that TARDIS takes off, the grass and whatever else is in shot probably jumps a foot <laughs> to the left. Why were extras called? for well, the park okay so it then cuts back to trevor and scott before a final shot which was pre-filmed ah. and that has cricketers waiting to start to play again and there were four uh -huh. cricketer extras hired in the paperwork so i believe that was specifically shot uh, and I, I wonder whether that would be in the same park on the same day well there was i think it was on the final day of the first two weeks of pre-filming they shot some material of the extras in cricket outfits, cricketing gear. Right. Um, and they wanted the full size prop for those scenes. So it seems as though something didn't work. Something went wrong. Something didn't go to plan. They couldn't achieve what they wanted because the photographs in Hammersmith Park were arranged after all of that pre filming was completed. Oh, so perhaps they wanted something more substantial than they managed to achieve in the final episode. Brilliant chaps, brilliant. Reese has just reeled that off. He's never seen The Mask of Mandragora. It's absolutely it's insane. because I've spent all the Reece... time looking through this paperwork. <laughs> I haven't got time for Mask of Mandragora. However, the next one is the Doctor using his ring to reflect the sun onto the TARDIS lock. Yeah, I'd like to see that. The, that had two votes as well. There was not a lot to this effect. Uh, it was quite simply two shots and they just do like a flare effect. Uh, and then mm. that's it. It's just a close-up uh, of the Doctor's ring. Oh, uh, a close-up with the yeah, do uh, from the Doctor's ring, which flares so we won't be seeing wizzy-wazzy no. beams of sunlight being, being mm. reflected or refracted. Oh, right, okay. And the last one with two votes, Daleks versus Visions, which is episode six now this is another interesting one we've got photos of the pre-filming and we see that the visions who are invisible have this sort of uh, um slightly amorphous blobby white form so how was that used well it i think it's often assumed that they become visible once they are dead because that's what happens with the spiridons in planet of the daleks uh, so I think that's generally what people assume, but I don't think that's the case because we have the cutting script and it describes the sequence of shots. The shots are numbered and there's something interesting in the numbering. So shot four is a Dalek entering and firing. Shot five is the empty space where the Vizian is standing. But then there's a shot 5A, which is a little bit oh. unusual, but same as the... Uh, TARDIS dissolve and shot 5A is described as the Vizian being killed in negative and then and this is the thing shot 5B is the empty space again so what that tells us is that we see the empty frame just jungle and then the image goes negative and as it does so the figure of the Vizian appears as this lumpy figure and it reacts or starts to collapse. And then as it does so, the picture goes back to normal and the vision is gone again. 
uh, and that's repeated on shot seven. So the, the final inference of that scene is the place is littered with invisible corpses. And it would have been interesting because these costumes were white. Uh, so in the negative effect, they would have appeared as a sort of big, black, blobby, weird things, which then collapsed to the ground. Amazing. So I think we need to go back to the photos taken during pre-filming and pop them into negative to see what people would have actually seen on screen. Mm, fascinating. Perhaps the most tantalizing thing is shot 18, which says Dalek in water. Ooh. It turns upstage. Now, the camera script is blank for this fight scene because it was shot on film. John Peel's novel is based in part on Dennis Spooner's draft script, and that says that uh, Visions push a Dalek into a mud pool, which doesn't quite match the cutting script note, but interesting. Dalek in water. Also, on a related note, there's a special effects requirement of Vision through pool. Um, and although that's down for the previous episodes, some of the other stuff down for the previous episode appears to be wrongly attributed. So mm -hmm. there might be a bit of a mix-up. So curious whether Vision in the pool is a, is a visual effects shot somehow achieved and Dalek in water also on film that we know nothing about. Hmm. Next up, quite mysterious, not often mentioned, three votes, The Screamers. This is episode three, and it's on Desperus, and the prisoners come under attack from, are they giant birds? Yeah, well, the script, the dialogue describes them as bats with a beak. In the scene where it attacks Kirkson, the, the camera pushes in on him, and the script refers to it as a bird, bird attachment, let into frame, fluttering. We do see a glimpse of it in a set photo during filming, and it maybe looks a bit like a, a rubber pterodactyl or something like that. But the impression that I get from the camera script is that it, it would have been sort of on the edge of frame, close to the camera, maybe defocused with Kirkson putting his hands up to his face to protect himself. So I think Camfield would have been using the lack of good view of it to disguise its shortcomings maybe as a prop. Yeah, that shot seems to be the only time we actually see one. There are sound effects scattered throughout the episode, sort of build up the idea of the screamers, but it's mm. really only that one moment where one appears on screen. So onto five votes, and this is certainly something I'd love to see. Uh, the monk's TARDIS <laughs> having an identity crisis, turning into all sorts of things, including a sop with camel. Yeah, well, this was pre-filmed using models, and it is scripted in detail, which is odd for the camera script, but the camera script notes the following objects depend on availability and any objects will do. So what the script prescribes is not necessarily what was on screen. Now the script says, a stone column, a Wells Fargo Wild West stagecoach, an unearthly tree, an igloo, a space rocket, a sarcophagus, a Martian building, or specifically the Xeros Space Museum, and a six-seater aeroplane, Sopwith Camel's never actually mentioned. Now, that's exactly what John Peel puts in his novelization, which is based in part on the script, but we don't know what was shot. Rosemary Howe wrote this uh, short novelization based on Ian Levine's notes, which he took after viewing the episode, and in that it says that it's a motorbike, an 18th century carriage, and then a covered wagon, and then a tank, and then finally the police box. I've got some extra information here. So there's always been uh, a mismatch between the narrated soundtrack of this, which is based upon the novelization descriptions, and the loose canon reconstruction. They had access to a film shot list for this sequence, which lists the Monk's TARDIS mixed to a motorcycle, a stagecoach, a western wagon, and a tank. Nah. So it sounds as though Ian Levine is spot on. Spot on. And um, also on this shot list, it says that all shots are on slate 148. Now that indicates to me that this shot list was written after they were filmed because you wouldn't predict what slate no. they would be on. So this seems to be a list of shots to edit together 
to compile the final film sequence. So I suspect this is what we would have seen. Nice. It would be lovely to believe that the the tank model that was used <laughs> is the one that later appears in Robot, Robot but uh, <laughs> unfortunately the years mm. don't quite line up. Uh. With seven votes, Sarah killing Brett Vion. It looks like a good, mm. a good grunt as he falls to the floor there. The script um, explains that Brett stops as the three of them are running out of the door. He hesitates and turns towards Sarah. So it's not that he couldn't get away, but he his downfall is that he wanted to make one last appeal to her. It's brilliant. Brutal episode, episode four, isn't it? Uh, with seven votes again, uh, the death of Marvik Chen. Now, the way this, this shot sounds great. So I was visualizing it earlier. We have a, we have a shot of an empty Dalek corridor. And Mavic Chen comes from behind the camera and heads away up the corridor and then stops and he turns back briefly to have a little rant <laughs> and then carries on down the corridor and two Daleks appear from left and right of frame in the foreground wow. cut to the Dalek guns firing cut to a different camera showing Chen flaring to negative cut back to the Dalek guns and then cut back to Chen the negative effect stops and he half turns with a look of surprise at the fact <laughs> of his own death. And then cut to Chen in long shot, falling to the floor with the Daleks framing picture left and right. Amazing. Sounds good. With eight votes, the delegates. Well, with episode two, we've really got the best and the bulk of mm. the delegate action in master plan trantis turns sure. up a couple of times before he's exterminated and salation is there as well then in episode 11 you get a little bit more of them but i think we're very lucky to have episode two and all the delegate action there we don't have the alf roberts malfa do we which is a must see <laughs> um <laughs> again with eight votes the doctor discovering chorus skeleton and tape recording mm. The camera script says that we see a, a sort of low shot angled upwards with the skeleton in the foreground and Hartnell comes in to shot and sees it. Uh, the skeleton's actually marked on the floor plan. Chalk outline. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. There's a good sort of arms askew. And uh, him picking up the tape recorder, he pops down out of frame, picks it up and then pops back up into frame. And walks off. Cool. There's so much you can get from these these camera scripts. You two are Honestly, so good. There's at so much information. Interpreting them and really visualizing everything you described. This is wonderful. With twelve votes, the destruction of the Daleks in episode twelve. Yeah, well, we got some good photos of this. Mm. Three FX props were provided by Shawcraft, um, which I think are really just lightweight shoulder sections, and the shoulder sections are, are blown out and they're the head collapses into the middle and it looks like the skirt sections and the head are hero props or at least fully working spares. Yeah, they, they look pretty good. If you look at the battle scene with the mechanoids at the end of the chase, essentially I think the same effect was employed again. Mm. You, can, you can't see it very clearly because of the battle montage. There's a lot of dissolves and uh, overlaid shots, but you can see the same idea applied there with these uh, sort of balsa wood shoulder sections blowing out and the, the head and neck collapsing into them. Yeah, the um, I think it's the cutting script says that the final image of the Daleks is just a, is a dissolve between the Daleks and an empty space on the desert set. But there was an extra day of filming sort of in the middle of production long after the the first set of pre-filming when they shot further Dalek material for those final scenes. So who knows what they may have decided in between shooting the first lot and the second lot. It's nice that we have this impression that, that Camfield kept thinking, I could make this better, and going back and doing more. 13 votes, Hartnell wishing all a Merry Christmas. <laughs> 18 votes, even more of the meddling monk. Yeah, he's great, Butterworth, in this. I mean, he's always great. 
He livens, livens up the second half. Sure. With 21 votes and in third, the full Katerina death scene. We covered that quite a lot on the previous episode. We did. There was an extra little thing that I saw when I was going through the paperwork. It might be a discarded idea, but... So we know that uh, trampoline instructor Rob Walker put on Doug Sheldon's wig and beard and doubled for him in two high shots. But even with the cameraman on the floor and Walker doing really big jumps, how much distance are you actually going to get of these bodies floating away? And I was looking through some of the paperwork and I saw that from the BBC library, they were appraising a piece of stock footage which they thought could work for the spacecraft exit. And they looked at a piece of footage of parachutists being ejected from a plane. The note specifies they could use footage of the figures receding from the plane before their parachutes open. So could that have provided uh -huh. long shots of Katerina and Kirkson? Uh, if the footage was daylight, they might have um, turned the image negative to create the look of white figures in space. And if that, if that was cut into the trampoline scene, I presume we would have no evidence of whether it was utilised or not, but it was definitely appraised for Interesting. use. Interesting. Uh, they did request uh, a six-foot camera platform for those filming dates, so that might have given them a bit more freedom of shooting. One other thing also discussed was how much slowdown could they achieve with the high-speed camera? Um, because as pointed out, the bits we see in episode five aren't really that slow. A memo from production assistant Victor's Retellis requests a camera that can slow down up to three times. And the camera they request is the R35. So I did a bit of digging and it looks like this is the Mitchell R35, which was a relatively new camera and that could shoot up to about 120 frames per second. So that's about five times slowdown. Uh, and, and what would the slowdown have been in, in the episode five trampolining Myra? Uh, I, th I think transition? that is about three times. I had a go at fiddling with the speed. So it can go a bit slower than that at least. Sure, brilliant. In second place, with 24 votes, the effects of the time destructor was well, a little bit vague because <laughs> it also includes the top vote. Anything to say there? I was looking down the stock footage list and they appraised and deemed good some material of sand dunes in close up and with sand blowing into camera. Um, and, and as a side note, Camfield insisted that only 35 mil stock was considered he had no interest in using 16 mil no. stock footage much like the um smoke overlay that's used in episode two they shot some special overlay footage for this sequence of dust and sand blowing so that would have been overlaid over a good few minutes of action and can anyone guess so the effects of the time <laughs> destructor had 24 votes can anyone guess what had 71 votes? I think it's Katerina not knowing how a key works. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the uh, policeman singing Christmas carols in the car? Oh, no. Oh, is it, is it Hartnell's um, comment about there being too many Arabs? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. If you were listening earlier, I said it's related to second place, and it is the death of Sarah Kingdom, oh. which is uh, which looks gruesome. Mm. We have photographic representation of the mm. effect. Anything to say? Yes, I do have some thoughts on this, but uh, we have some exciting information to go through about what the Australian censors thought needed to be cut. Uh, so I think we'll come back to that. Oh. On to discuss the missing episodes and there's quite a lot to get through so we'll cover 
what we have and where it came from, how it showed up. And then last of all, we'll discuss whether we think there's the remotest possibility of any more of Dalek's master plan being found. So to try and get through this huge chunk of data and put it into some sort of narrative order, let's first discuss overseas sales of Dalek's master plan and the matter of copies being sent elsewhere. And then we'll run through the clips we have and where they came from and then we'll look at how episodes 5 and 10 came back and then episode 2 came back and then finally well let's see where we get to so it's well known that the Daleks master plan wasn't sold overseas and that it didn't make it past the Australian censors and not all of Daleks master plan was offered to Australia in the first place and that was by design the Christmas Day episode episode 7 the Feast of Stephen was only ever made with the British audience in mind and thought of as disposable therefore it's not thought to have ever been film recorded is there any possibility that it was recorded anyway is it possible that the tranche of episodes as a serial was given a single film recording order for overseas broadcast and then they pick the bones out of it later? Unfortunately, it, that doesn't seem to be the way that the process worked. It was very regimented and depended on the right bits of paper being filed every mm. week. There wasn't a sort of standing order to say, always record Doctor Who. For every episode recorded, the production team had to issue a form in order to request that the tape be retained after broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Dark's Master Plan episode one, three days after they recorded, John Wiles submits this form so that they hold the tape until further notice. And the reason given is wanted for possible repeat. And that's probably just a generic reason that they always put, and they probably did. Just in case there was another president assassinated. <laughs> exactly. So probably as a matter of course, the production team were issuing these forms a couple of days after they recorded every episode to make sure the tape was kept. And then there would have to be another form issued to request a film recording. This would be at the behest of BBC Enterprises because they were the ones who wanted the film for overseas sales. Mm. Uh, uh -huh. We Not only do we know that Enterprises never offered the Feast of Stephen for sale. They never recorded it. They never film recorded it either. Uh, Ian Levine in the 1970s went through their paperwork and they had an accession record card for every episode of Doctor Who except for the Feast of Stephen. So that means they film recorded every episode apart from the Feast of Stephen. They never had that in their holdings, in their library. Seems pretty conclusive then doesn't it yes is it possible for argument's sake that due to the sort of production line nature of you know people sleepwalking through their jobs or or just preempting things is it conceivable that someone did it anyway without the paperwork existing for it i think it would have been difficult not only for someone to notice that it hadn't been film recorded but also to go about getting it film recorded because Doctor Who sometimes was film recorded during transmission and other mm. times they called the tape up and played it back and recorded it so that means someone let's say they noticed that they hadn't had uh, a request for to record Doctor Who that week to record the Feast of Stephen it could easily be explained as they were going to do it a couple of weeks later from the tape so they wouldn't be able to notice that it wasn't being recorded so they'd wait they wouldn't be able to just make a recording from the tape off their own bat because the tapes were managed by the engineering department and the tapes would be requested using a tape number someone in the telerecording department wouldn't know the tape number for the feast of stephen so they wouldn't be able to just go and grab it then you'd have to book the playback equipment and the telerecording equipment was in demand equipment time was valuable so really there's no way that an illicit recording of a full program is likely to have been made oh that's peed on our picnics isn't it <laughs> <laughs> when i spoke on um, uh, gav's podcast about this i alluded to a theory that missing episodes commander-in-chief 
Paul Venezes has espoused. And I wrote to Paul for a refresher on how that might have worked. And he kindly wrote back to me. And uh, what he had to say was that, Reese, as you said, the, the, the paperwork that exists for film recordings exists only for the purpose of overseas sales. And uh, Paul is aware that the BBC also made film recordings for internal review purposes and that because managers would be at home on Christmas Day, material may have been routinely film recorded for internal review to ensure that the schedule was editorially safe. And <laughs> he went on to say that whilst this is only a theory, years ago in 88 when he was at film school, one of his fellow students found a film recording in a cupboard of waste film. A lot of it had been brought there by the senior lecturer who used to be the film unit manager at BBC Bristol. And it was a film recording of an entertainment pilot show made in Bristol in 1968 and fronted by the Wurzels. He sent it to Adam Lee at the BBC Archive and he confirmed it was screened on the network and therefore they would archive it as they had no other copy. Uh, what was interesting about that recording, Paul said, was that it was an FR positive. There was never a negative. These were the equivalent of having a VHS viewing copy made for internal review. So he's proposing that due to the specific circumstances surrounding the broadcaster Feast of Stephen, a film recording may have been made for internal review and not for enterprises. And he said it's worth noting that the surviving print of the pilot episode of Doctor Who is not an enterprises recording. It was made for internal review. Naturally, he finishes, he concludes, of course, if one was made, it would be a stretch for it still to survive to this day. Fascinating. So he's telling us there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Reese, what's an FR positive? I think that's a film recording positive. So mm. I, I believe it's easier to strike more prints from a negative. So it's a different process to strike prints from a positive. So a positive suggests that you just want one copy, a one off. Sure. Okay. So back to Dalek's master plan. Episodes 1 to 6 and 8 to 12, no episode 7, were duly sent off uh, to Australia for review by the censors prior to purchase. But as we know, they never in fact bought it. And as I said at the top of the episode, some time ago, John Preddle kindly took the time to have a chat with me. And here's what he had to say about the censorship process. John, tell me about the Master Plan films arriving in Australia and what happened. The films were offered to the ABC and uh, were sent to the ABC in March of 1966. Uh -huh. And this was Master Plan along with Mission to the Unknown, just simply because that block of episodes was treated as a, as, as a package. And so the films eventually arrived, they were flown in by plane, and then when it came time for the censor to look at them, uh, because it was a requirement at that time, and uh, because Doctor Who was a serial, uh, it was a requirement that the censor had to look at each serial in one session, in one go. And the problem is, of course, is with Master Plan and also with Mission Attacked Onto It, that was you know, a, a six-hour viewing session, which the censor then needed time to fit into their um, daily schedule. So it wasn't until September of '66 that the censors were able to view the episode. So the process was in those days was that the censor would sit down, to, there was two of them, they would sit down and view the episodes starting in the morning and going through the day, each one making their own individual notes as to the content and what they thought might have been earmarked for deletion or, or whatever. Yeah. And then at the end of the session, they would then compare notes and draft up a report, which was then given to the ABC for comment. Uh -huh. Um, so both censors pretty much thought the, the master plan, or well, certainly Mission to the Unknown, was given a rejection. They regarded it as being, as being too horrifying and, and refused to therefore register the film. Basically, they banned it. Whereas master plan, the, the episodes were um, given A ratings, uh -huh. but also some needed cutting. So even though they were being cut, they were still given an, an A rating. Yeah. 
which in terms of the ABC's requirement, they needed a G rating in order to screen the episode in their time slot, which was usually at that point 6.30 in the evening. An A rating meant it couldn't be aired until after 7.30, which the ABC didn't want to do, because it would mean that they could either screen the other episodes at 6.30 and then master plan later on at night, which you know, they didn't want to do that. And also they could have heavily edited the episode, but at the end of that, after doing all that, taking into account all the things that the censor wanted removed, yep. there wouldn't have been much wouldn't have been much of the episodes left, and you'd, they'd end up with a whole uh, yeah, reels of film that had all these splices yeah. in it, which would have problems. Uh, and so they couldn't edit it to give it narrative sense, and they wouldn't have moved it to put it later in the schedule. So what happened then? The ABC just basically said, well, if we can't screen it at 6.30, we, we, we just won't bother buying it. So uh, mm. in doing so, um, that sort of had a roll-on effect because it meant that the, the BBC couldn't get a sale from Australia, which affected all future uh, sales to Commonwealth countries. But um, the BBC's office in Sydney get back all the reports on the, the censorship uh, outcomes, and obviously they wanted to get a sale of Master Plan and Mission. Sure. So the BBC themselves kind of stepped in and kind of um, tried to negotiate with the censor to come up with some sort of compromise. But that all fell through and by March of 1967. So pretty much a whole year after the films had arrived in the country, they just kind of said, OK, the censors aren't going to get, um, shift their, um, their rating and, and their decision, so we just uh, have to uh, withdraw and pull the offer from, from the table. Sure. And so, so what do you think happened to the films? Well, I'm fairly confident the films would have gone back to the BBC, and that's the BBC in the UK, because the films came into the country in what's known as an importation. So it's an importer thing. And mm. in terms of, of the censorship, censorship requirement, any banned or rejected films had to go back to the importer. I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty confident the films went back to the UK. There's no reason for them to be stuck in, in, in Australia. The ABC couldn't do anything with them, so they certainly never had possession of them. The, the censor's not going to stick them in a the cupboard because what's the point? You know, <laughs> that's not their job. And they wouldn't have gone into any sort of long-term storage because simply that, that, that's just taking shelf space. So I'm fairly confident the films would have gone back to the UK. Obviously, the question is what happened to them after that. Sure. So, more from John later, but since John and I spoke, Reese, you've been looking at the censorship process in detail as well. Yes, we were lucky to be able to look at images of the original handwritten censor notes that were discovered all those years ago by the diligent research of Damien Shanahan, and there's some really interesting information to extract from them. There are two relevant classifications here. Uh, an A rating, which means it's unsuitable for children, has to be shown after 7.30pm, or a G rating, which means a general audience. Now, one of the censors rated all of the episodes of Master Plan as an A, with cuts <laughs> or reductions. They seem to initially rate episode 10 as a G, but then, towards the end, note that the Egyptians are electrocuted and revise their rating to an A. The other censor seems at first to reject the first three episodes, like Mission, but mm. they seem to have scribbled out the reject rating and revised to an A with cuts. Uh, then episodes four to six, A with cuts. Episodes eight to 11, a G with cuts. And then episode 12 as an A with cuts. So it seems as though the early stuff is where they're having the most issues with the content. Sure. And episode 12. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the the Terry Nation stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is a problem because although the ABC originally showed Doctor Who in an A rating slot at 7.30, oh. from the Web Planet onwards, it was moved to a tea time children's slot, 6.30. So if you want examples of what stories were rated A, An Unearthly Child, The Daleks, Edge of Destruction, Keys of Marinus, The Sensorites, Dalek Invasion of Earth, wow. and The Rescue were all rated A by the Australian wow. censors. And Delicate. Well, quite. Once they started broadcasting the show 
in the new earlier time slot, they actually asked the censors to reconsider the classifications of those stories in order to fit the new time slot. And the censorize was the only one that they managed to reclassify as a G. So that gives a little bit of context to their assessment of master plan. I was watching the censorize today. It's quite frightening. Frighteningly tedious. <laughs> So uh, because it's really important, it's a really important notion for the whole Missing Episodes era, we may have touched on it before. John's just alluded to it. Can we just bottom out what's known as the Commonwealth Quota System and, and why that means that if Australia didn't buy it, then it wouldn't go on for sale anywhere else? Yeah, it, it seems that the ABC payments covered upfront clearance costs for the Commonwealth region, meaning that there weren't additional fees that further countries would have to pay. And to get an impression of how significant the Australian contribution was, if we look, yeah. the first three stories, uh, Nigeria paid £10 per episode. Uh, yeah. Australia paid £575 per episode, more than 50 times more than what Nigeria were paying. So if Australia aren't buying a story, you can't find 50 Nigerias to cover the same cost. Canada were paying £330 an episode. So if, if Canada had continued buying the series, uh, they might have been able to salvage the sale of Master Plan. And the US would have paid a lot as well, but they never showed enough interest. So, yeah, so... <laughs> it's Australia or bust. It's Australia or bust, sure. And by the time they've finished wrangling with the censors, as well, counting against master plan and future sales, Terry Nation embargoes the Daleks for exclusivity for his own production. Yeah, so Terry Nation at this point was trying to sort of extract the Daleks from Doctor Who in order to create his own spin-off which he very helpfully called the Daleks. Uh, it's often known by its pilot episode title, The Destroyers. Uh, and he teamed up with a, a toy manufacturer called uh, Fred Alper. And um, it seems from reading the paperwork that Alper was uh, the more belligerent of the two and conducting most of the negotiations and trying to secure all the rights for all the Dalek merchandise in all its forms, stage plays and magazines and everything they could so that Terry Nation would be completely free to sell his his spin-off series and control all of all of the rights because the Nation and BBC had a 50-50 share in the use of the Daleks. So one of the conditions that they were trying to impose was to make sure that the Daleks weren't seen anywhere other than in the forthcoming spin-off series. So Nation was trying to suppress the repeats and future Dalek serials in the Doctor Who TV series. And that also impacted Power of the Daleks, Evil of the Daleks, and and probably limited their capacity to be sold as yeah. well. They'd done Power of the Daleks, and, and as this all was unfolding, they just managed to sneak in a commission for Evil of the Daleks before they signed the contracts to say no more Dalek serials. It's always this weird thing that it's often said sure. that the Daleks were wiped out in Doctor Who so that they could live a life outside the program that spawned them. But that doesn't really make much sense from Terry Nation's point of view if you're writing the final end to your creation as a springboard to their further adventures. So, I mean, I kind of always look at the, the final end in Evil of the Daleks as the BBC sort of almost taking a swipe at Terry Nation and extinguishing the Daleks. But yeah, Terry Nation wanted to essentially make sure that Evil of the Daleks was the last Dalek production. Even if a sale had been agreed by the ABC, it looks as though this these developments might have curtailed any sales to other countries. So we wouldn't be much better off than we are now. <laughs> I think we've just depressed <laughs> absolutely everyone in the last in the last 20 minutes um, <laughs> do you want to find out exactly why the censors had problems with master plan mm. i do indeed what did they find then 
So I'll I'll go through it episode by episode, and the notes they make are a mixture of observations that inform the classification that they give and instructions to cut or delete or reduce certain material. So the first episode, uh, they didn't like references to killing, so they wanted to remove the lines, get out of here or I'll kill you now, give me that key or I'll oh, wow. kill you. They even make a note about where the devil are you, mention of the devil. Um, wow. This comes up a few times, the idea of reducing to a flash. So when Kirk Gantry is shot by the Dalek, says man shot by mechanism, disintegrates, falls to the ground, reduce that to a flash. So cut it out as much as possible. Just going to say, with the devil thing, what did they think of Devil's Planet? Is that mentioned? <laughs> That's a good point. They don't, they don't single out the title for criticism, but I mean, they rated it A anyway. They, they changed it on the screen. <laughs> so it said, Cook, Pass, Babtridge. <laughs> Then they wanted to cut uh, a close-up shot of Kurt's face, open mouth. So that's material that's not in the film sequence that we have. That's a shot in the studio after that film insert has been played mm. in. So while the film insert is being played or during a recording break, they make up Brian Kant in sort of scorched face paint and have him lie in position ready to show at the end of the scene once the Daleks have moved off. Next episode, Day of Armageddon, we've got this one. So they don't like entry of faceless man with hairy hands. <laughs> that's Hartnell, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's just that's just Zephon walking down the ramp. Yeah, they mm. were waving like his arms. Him. Yeah, later they say delete. Man walks in with claw feet and no face. Uh, reduce hideous sight of man in black gown. Then uh, wow. delete captured representative struggles with vegetable arms. <laughs> you probably would struggle if you had vegetable arms. <laughs> then uh, they Kale. made a note of the Daleks burning down the forest. Men in peculiar masks shown in close-up. Oh, close-up yeah. shots of men wearing masks. Reduce man with pointed teeth makes speech. So they really <laughs> don't like the uh, delegates. No. And they're, they're cutting big chunks of important plot yeah they they do say at one point reduce taking into account dialogue ah but not always generally the sensor cuts what you usually see are just little snips these yeah. are really significant Reductions. swathes of stuff mm. that they're taking issue with episode three they say terror on faces as the rocket lifts off and in the uh in the camera script at that point there are a, there's a sequence of close-ups of their faces so this is the they're in the spa so it's the doctor yeah. katarina brett stephen there are there's a quick sequence of close-ups of their faces so because there's a line that's rather a violent acceleration young man if hartnell was baring his teeth i mean we already know they don't like pointed teeth <laughs> <laughs> They wanted to delete the line, you will go totally blind. A uh, group of long-haired men, long beards, all unkempt. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Kirkson and Co. Yep. Mm. And then delete girl screams when unkempt man puts arm around her neck. Wow. Then at the start of the next episode, episode four, again, Katarina attacked by unkempt man, reduced substantially man wrestles with screaming girl who presses button and falls into space man and woman fall from rocket shots of katarina and man falling through space now there's an aspect here that intrigues me they don't like the struggle that we thankfully still have in the surviving clip and the final shot they want removed is katarina and man floating through space which we talked about and may conceivably have been a stock footage of some parachute jumpers but in between that they note that says man and woman fall from rocket now the sensors are describing exactly what they're seeing in the shot for assessment so the third sensor shot is them in space as expected but this intermediate shot mentions a rocket so what form does that viewpoint take could it be achieved during the filming session with some kind of doorway? Are they coming out of a little piece of set? Is it the view from the door? Could it even be a model shot we're not aware of? It just, to me, 
seems incongruous. Man and woman fall from rocket. The rocket is mentioned in that shot that they are putting a question mark next to, compared to the following shot, which is them in space. So it's distinctly different from two bodies floating in space. Mm. It is a man and woman falling from rocket. We know that the scene from after the existing clip continues with studio material. What was planned was a shot from inside the airlock space, looking through the door, Stephen seeing the empty airlock, and then the scene continues with Hartnell's short speech. I think that what they are referring to is suggestive of a reverse angle, potentially with the spa model featured. I know I said uh, perhaps it was a piece of set, but perhaps also it was some kind of establishing shot with the model in. Guess we'll never know unless we ask Ian Levine. So after that, there's a close-up shot of man with pointed teeth. Daxter shot, cries as he falls to ground. Uh, Sarah shoots Brett, then delete. They must be shot on sight, but aim for the head. They didn't like that aim for the head bit. Uh, <laughs> next episode, episode five, the existing episode. Cut that bit, cut the cliffhanger bit again. They say same as closing of previous episode. They then say three people affected by glass case with experiment. One of them says electrocution of Doctor Who. And then their next note is, it now appears they have been de-astralized. Whatever they mean by that. That's the transition to Myra yeah. then, is it? And the other sense <laughs> says apparitions of man and woman scene. And then they make a note about the giant footprints appearing in the mud. Episode six, they want to cut the weird creatures seen in close-up. And the other sensor ah. says, delete monster, black and woolly. So this is the Visians when they get exterminated by the Daleks. As I mentioned, when the Daleks shoot them, they briefly become visible. And they would have been in negative effect. And the costumes were white. Therefore, these creatures, as the sensors were perceiving them, were they were seeing them as black. The sensors also say reduce. Young man receives shock when he presses can into holder and screams. Yeah, I had a little look at that today. And Stephen, this is Stephen uh, using reliance power or whatever it is to create the force field around himself. And um, yeah, he, he gives that a really harrowing, blood curdling scream when he gets the, the power through him. So you can you can imagine that they were worried about the sensitivities of a young audience it's not a sensor question but do we know how they achieved a force field around they probably Steve? just pretended didn't they probably didn't yeah. do anything they didn't animate on a ready <laughs> ready brick glow or anything like that no no the screams are on point throughout master plan really good mm. screaming so we skip over the feast of stephen because christmas doesn't exist in australia and we've got Volcano. They talk about man in spotted costume, also man with pointed teeth. Uh, one of them makes a note about abject insanity. They say, reduce and cut man with pointed teeth, given electric shock, frothy liquid on floor. The other sensor says, mm. pointed teeth reduced to a mass of suds, delete heap of froth on floor. That's fascinating. That was the Daleks exterminating Trantis. A normal extermination, and yet they've given us this exciting extra special effect of stuff on the floor of his uh, reduced remains. So that's a fascinating visual to learn about. Grizzly. There's uh, also supposed to be a whip pan to Chen's horrified face as he sees this. So nine. Golden Death onto Egypt. They make notes about exterminate the creatures. One man given electric shock followed by a number of others. Uh, episode 10, this seems to be the one they have the fewest complaints about. It says, reduce Egyptians attack war machines, electric shocks. Then they seem to be a bit confused. How, how is it quicker? <laughs> how is it quicker or easier to write war machines <laughs> than Daleks? Have they not understood yet what the bloody things are called? <laughs> it's like Sorry. a sort of willful <laughs> ignorance and determination not to pander to the stupid names. That well, we saw how many different vegetable things they describe Zephon with. <laughs> They're just very bored people. I mean, they had to watch this whole thing in a day. They've got to get the entertainment they can. Yet yeah, then one of them seems to be a bit confused at the end of the episode. 
Then they say reduce further electric shocks, which is when the monk flees to his TARDIS. So they didn't like the monk being threatened with electric shocks. And then at the end, one says general electric shock as title comes up. It's when the console emits some oh, yeah. smoke. Uh, one of them seemed to think that was a problem. And they raise it again at the start of episode 11. They say gen reduce general electric shock, three people on floor. Return of men wearing fancy costumes and masks. Uh, one man in costume shot, falls to ground, groaning. Now, episode 12. Uh, <laughs> they first take issue with Chen's line, I could kill you myself. True to form. Uh, it says, man chased by Daleks, fired upon two shots of man falling, which I think is what you said earlier, Gav. Yeah. Then we come on to the time destructor stuff so they said sarah growing older hair changes color doctor ages also bodies covered with sand blown by wind another the other sensor said reduce doctor and sarah aging in high wind reducing to skeletons then the other sensor says reduce face disintegrating sarah Ooh. skeleton only further close-up of face what does that mean yeah, I have no idea about a disintegrating face shot. That's fascinating. We know they've used the term disintegrate before to describe something that we can see didn't actually depict yeah, disintegration. True. That may be their interpretation of an optical dissolve. There was an aging sequence, wasn't there? She had aging makeup on and there was a an older double, wasn't there? Yeah, there seemed to be have been a few stages. Aging makeup, the double and then this skeleton and i think there is a memo they request padding for the costume to fit a skeleton supplied by props so there was a skeleton and then the further close-up of face that's intriguing because i don't think that's mentioned in the filming script mm. okay and the last point they make is right towards the end of the episode and we know this because they are annotating each of their observations with with the time they seem to have had a clock or they were looking at their watch they make a note of the time they record these observations and they make a note of when they start the episode so we can tell that this last point comes right before the episode ends and what they say at this point has become slightly confused over the years uh, this information was first put out in a fanzine written by damien shanahan uh, zerinza an australian fan magazine which had a detailed write-up of the sensor process and these notes. But the notes were sort of compiled together into one because obviously we're dealing with the notes of two sensors. Damien merged the two together mm. to make one piece. But it seems that he mistranscribed this last point. So what he had put forward was that the sensors said, Sarah appears on the ground, mm. but we've had access to the original handwritten sensor notes and it actually seems that they say hand appears on the ground oh. now what does this mean it's difficult to see how something might appear on the ground at this point because the final scene is played out in a single shot where Stephen comes in in the background hartnell's already outside the tardis in shot and then Stephen comes forward they talk, Stephen walks back to the TARDIS, the Doctor stays in shot, the camera pulls in close to him, the Doctor moves towards the camera to a close-up to deliver his final line, and then walks back to the TARDIS. So, in one single shot, kind of wide, not too much camera movement, it's difficult to see how anything would suddenly appear in this shot, especially given there's nothing in the scripted action or the dialogue that fits with this and this is minutes after sarah's demise and we believe that she turned to dust or at least that's how loose cannon have presented it to us that there would be nothing left of her so we're presuming this is sarah's hand that would make the most sense as we know there was a shot of her skeletal hand laid out in bicarbonate of soda yeah and we've seen loose cannon's recreation of that but if she was completely turned to dust, surely there was no hand 
of hers left to cut back to. Yes, and why why would it appear again afterwards? Are we being perhaps misled by the original belief that that word said Sarah, and we now think it says hand, and perhaps we're sort of projecting one thought onto the other? I'm just, just thinking slightly laterally in terms of these senses are potentially being slightly interpretive of what they're seeing on screen. I mean, they talk about electrocutions instead of exterminations and, you know, they refer to the aliens as, as vegetable people. So <laughs> just exploring a thought, there is another hand-like object that I can immediately think of that was on set and that was the Dalek embryo uh. that was manipulated yeah by the hand of a special effects technician because there's a there's a behind the scenes photo of him with his arm under the sand that's victor's retellis is it so victor's i didn't know that so victor's retellis is operating like a hand puppet the dalek mm. mutant on the sand so is it conceivable that this sensor doesn't know how better to describe a Dalek embryo? Because they can't even be bothered to use the term Dalek <laughs> at all in their sensor notes. They keep referring to them as war machines. So I don't have every faith that they may be entirely paying attention after 12 episodes mm. of Master Plan. Sorry, 11 episodes of Master Plan. And it might make sense. Well, we know that Hartnell picks up the Dalek embryo in that last scene picks it up and holds it up to Stephen, but i don't think they describe that as it appearing and it's certainly not no. on the ground if he's picking it up but so the tardis dematerialization is on film and on the film shot list there is a shot of the tardis in place and then there is a shot of the empty set so the dematerialization would have been a crossfade between those two an optical dissolve all on film it wasn't going between a film shot and a studio shot or a uh, studio shot and a photo caption as we saw in the um, cricket match but after this film sequence there is listed in the camera script a photo blow up it doesn't say anywhere mm. what that photo blow up is but what if that was an image of the dalek mutant which has just been referred to in the script so mm. as the credits are rolling the tardis dematerializes there's the empty landscape of kemble and then you crossfade to an image of the Dalek mutant. They do a similar thing in the Myth Makers in the final episode after the cliffhanger as the credits roll. They crossfade to an image, I think, of the wooden horse as a sort of vignette of the piece uh, as you finish the story. So, so what if they did something similar here, showing the, the Dalek mutant embryo as a sort of echo of the discussion between Stephen and the Doctor about mm. the Daleks being reverted back as one last yeah. image of the story. Well, as an alternative offering, because they had this plot point that time rolled back, is it conceivable it was Sarah's hand using the same reasoning? Because... The whole point of having the Dalek embryo was that it was saying that time had rolled mm. back into the Dalek's earliest form. Is it conceivable that essentially Sarah's form, there was a hint of it returning? That's a good point. Undecomposed. I think there's been a misconception around the bicarb hand in that it's always thought of as being blown away by the wind. But the description mm. in the film shot list just says that it's supposed to be the sort of calcified remains of the hand it says trace out the the lines in bicarbonate of soda but it there's no direction to blow it away with the, the wind blower mm. so the hand could still have been there and so it's it would be logical to go back to an image of that hand and that would resonate just just as effectively so there we go I think that's utterly fascinating. And I think one of the most fascinating things that you've highlighted, which I had no awareness of whatsoever, was the other A-rated serials. Okay, there's lots of cuts and reductions required for this, and, mm. we, uh, and we don't know here anyway what the cuts and reductions that were required for An Unearthly Child, The Daleks, Edge of Destruction, and so on. 
but it somewhat undermines the point that Dalek's master plan was too mm. violent in yeah. itself compared to the rest of the Hartnell mm. era because we know they rated the other things A. That's utterly fascinating, Reese. Thank you so much. That's really great. It's, it was really interesting to, to see these, these observations about the story that are untarnished by the passage of time. We know these are accurate mm. observations, mm. you know, recorded by people watching the entire thing in one day. Lucky gits. <laughs> we now have an extraordinarily clear picture about the circumstances of films being sent to Australia, the review of the censors, why they didn't buy it. But we have some of Dalek's master plan. We have three entire episodes and we have a series of clips. So why don't we run through the clips that we have and then the episodes that we have and just quickly run through how they came about and where they existed and maybe why we have them. So Blue Peter yielded clips, substantial clips as well for episodes three and four. Yes, there's a lengthy clip that was used in a 1971 edition of Blue Peter. That was uh, just before the Daleks returned in Day of the Daleks, and it was a bit of a teaser for that. They had some Daleks in the studio. Um, mm -hmm. And then in 1973, leading up to the 10th anniversary of the show, Blue Peter did a sort of retrospective on moments from the show and that's that's how we have the regeneration clip from the 10th planet uh, that's where they showed the episode 4 clip so in 1971 Blue Peter borrowed the print of episode 3 from BBC Enterprises and in 1973 they borrowed a print of episode 3 again and they mm. also borrowed the print of episode 4 from the film library this is different to BBC Enterprises. The film library was the BBC's repository of programmes originated on film, which this episode was not. So the film library held all those episodes that were broadcast from 35mm, The Space Pirates sure. 2, for example. Yep. But there were a handful of 16mm prints that ended up there for some reason or other. We don't quite know why. But for posterity? It's unlikely. It's examples of the art do you know what i mean it wasn't really their remit and it wasn't really intended for preserving things it was more a library of stuff so film oh, material might be reused sure. so a lot of newsreel footage that would have mm. a, a reuse value so that would go into the film library it's a library for pulling stuff back out of it's a practical um, library rather than a rather than an archive yes, rather yeah. than an archive so the doctor who stuff that did end up there either ends up there by quirk of being recorded to 35 millimeter sure. or the 60 millimeter prints make their way there for some reason or other maybe it's an accident maybe someone didn't know where they should be sent hmm. so the print of dark's master plan episode four was supplied by the film library now the hmm. film library didn't get this print back they sent several requests to the blue beta production office for this film to be returned and mm. it never came back to them and for a long time this was suspected to be, have been pinched by a fan because the signature on the paperwork for loaning the print was J Smith <laughs> <laughs> this turns out to have been Lupe de <laughs> film editor Justin Smith a real person <laughs> with a real job who would have been doing that it's not Certain... it's such a fan theory that is it yeah. it's like it's like web 3 being nicked yeah. because <laughs> it's the prick yeah, years first you could, appearance you could make up a reason to nick <laughs> any of those nine episodes that were returned yeah i would have nicked episode four yes so episode four never made its way back to the film library where did it go don't know nobody knows you check justin smith's cupboard <laughs> it's often conflated or confused i think Dalek's Master Plan 4 with 10th Planet 4. 
and those stories get jumbled. So, so what's the deal with Tenth Planet for? Yeah, that's right. It's assumed that because we have episodes one to three, that episode four must have been from the same source and not returned by Blue Peter. But episodes one to three uh, existed in the film library. The film library never held episode four. For some reason, the film library ended up with these three episodes, but they never had an index card registering the receipt of episode four. The only index card that they had for an episode that they didn't hold when their inventory was checked in 1978, I think, was for episode four of Dalek's Master Plan. Hmm. Tenth Planet Four at this time, Enterprises probably still had the film recording negatives. So they could have struck a print for Blue Peter, and if it didn't come back, they'd still have the negatives so they could make a new one if they needed it. So I remember back in the early 90s, when around the 30th, there was a documentary on BBC Two, Resistance is Useless, and 30 Years in the TARDIS came about, and I remember exciting moving pictures of a spa, and mm. Brian Kant uh, shuffling around Kemble. <laughs> how, how, why do they exist? So the film inserts for episode two were always held in the film library as a mute 35mm print mm -hmm. with a corresponding magnetic soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So that meant they were in two tins. And this material was called up for use in the documentaries, but the pictures weren't there. It was just the soundtrack. But there was also a mute 35mm print and negative of the film inserts for episode one, mm. as well as the episode two soundtrack. So what seems to have happened is that this material was all logged as episode two. Someone inspected it and assumed the episode two print was redundant, got rid of it. But yeah, but we did have the, the moving pictures from clips Yes. For episode two. Yeah, so it turns out that these were held in a private collection. Mm. Uh, they'd been purchased in good faith. and From when, whom? Who knows? Could have been an ex-BBC person. I mean, there were a lot of film inserts in private collections around that time. A whole load of them ended up being sold on eBay uh, in the early noughties. The two Doctors film inserts ended up in private hands, sold around then. Gosh. And that the two Doctor stuff was junked by the BBC very shortly before they wanted to do a special edition of the two Doctors. They were going to do the two Doctors instead of the five Doctors. They were going to do the two Doctors first. And there were a bunch of tapes and the film at the BBC. And those were the last sort of Doctor Who outtakes to be junked before they got there. And then finally on the clips, <laughs> we've got some oddments, haven't we? So there's a couple of frames of footage of uh, the volcano in Volcano. Yeah, it's not clear where those come from. I believe they were found at Doctor Who magazine. I think it's a print of the strips. So the film didn't exist, but it was a print of these strips of film. It's possible that they came from Barry Newbury because he kept at least one film trim from the art. Mm. We now know Derek Dodd had several film strips from The Power of the Daleks, so it might have been something like that, exposure test strips, and he just picked a couple. Brilliant, Reese. How I, I'm still trying to fathom how you can <laughs> absorb all this stuff and yet not have a hankering demand to fill the gap in your head and watch uh, Vengeance on Varos. I like the comfort of knowing that one day I can watch Vengeance on Varos anew. And you it can't might push information out of your head about the That's Dalek. The <laughs> I might forget something important. So I think in terms of just being completist, it's worth also pointing out that John Wiles didn't commission John Cura to take telesnaps, but Thankfully, Robert Jewell took some off-screen photographs of Feast of Stephen, which gives us at least some idea of, of what it looks like. We're so lucky that out of all the episodes that he could have been in, it's that one, the one that is the most missing, mm. that he has covered. And sure. Impossibly, we have these 
off-screen photographs. And not only photos of him, but he photographed the most important moment of the episode, Hartnell's toast to camera. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. And we should just mention as well, and we'll talk about audios later in the um later in the in the podcast series. But again, we've got audios thanks to Richard Landon, David Holman, and the brilliant crystal clear recordings of Graham Strong. Heroes. Mm. Heroes, and it's a miracle that we're so lucky <laughs> to have multiple copies of mm. all these episodes. It's insane. Multiple people on that one that brief twenty five minutes that those yeah. episodes were shown. Several people had their tape recorders plugged in. One last thing, just because I'm curious to know more about it. This was news to me, but I read in Wiped today that a stock shot of a fake sun that was used in this story, a film insert, oh, also yeah. exists at the BBC. I assume that's the shot in episode 10 of the sun that crossfades to the Daleks' dome, but it's interesting that that's still around. So perhaps that opens up the possibility of other bits of so-called stock footage still mm. existing from the story. And other stories, yeah. We've got the reference numbers for the, for example, the parachute shots that were looked at. Ah. If they still existed, we could uh, assess those. Somebody find them. Because after the production, production assistant Victor Zretelis sends a memo to the, I think, the librarian to make sure that they keep hold of these stock shots. They said they recorded similar material for other shows and it had been mislaid and they wanted to make sure that this stuff was still around if they wanted to use it again. Mm. So where is it? So on to complete episodes. Uh, it's well known that episodes 5 and 10 were found in 1983, 39 years ago. They've often described to have been found in the basement of a Mormon church. And then in 2004, we were blessed to be able to see episode 2, Day of Armageddon, when that was returned. So I spoke to John Preddle about these returns, and here that is. <laughs> Um, in 1983, Steve Bryant got a phone call at the BBC asking if he'd like episodes 5 and 10 of Dalek's Master Plan back. That's right, yes. Um, these two film prints were apparently found in the basement of uh, a Mormon church in Wandsworth, I believe. So uh, it was uh, a, very un a very unusual recovery <laughs> because this, the, the reasons why the films were in that location has never really been uh, resolved because there's too many sort of anomalies surrounding it to really sort of grasp you know, what, what actually happened sure. at that time. And also I think the, a lot of the information about the recovery has kind of been distorted because there were so many different accounts of the recovery uh, that was published in the various fanzines of the time. And each one told a different story of, or, or had, had, had a different retelling of the recovery, and none of them were sort of like agreed with each other. So there was certainly a lot of, uh, well, to a degree, some fudging of the facts, to, so to speak, of uh, what actually happened, simply because um, it was all told after the, you know, long after the event. So a lot of the details got distorted in the retelling. And Steve Bryant was the only point of contact. Yeah, um, well, Steve Bryant was at the time the archive selector uh, at the BBC, but I think it was at one of his um, co-workers, a guy called Gareth Morris, who actually took the call and passed the message on to Steve. And so some time had passed between getting the call and somebody actually going to the church to collect the items. And then Steve was interviewed by Doctor Who magazine and told quite a lengthy narrative of as, as the, to, to the sequence of events. So it's been discussed <laughs> that the church was an ex-BBC property or the films were found in an ex-BBC property. Yeah, well, the church itself has always been there. there. There has always been a Mormon place of worship on that location. It's not the same building because the building that's there now and was there in 83, it was a new construct that I think was completed in 78. So it was only like five or six years old Right at the time, so the BBC was never at that location um, on Nineteen Hill Lane. And as I say, the Mormon Church had always been there. There'd been a building that was used for that purpose, going dating back to the turn of the century. 
and during the war it was used as a uh, sort of a refuge. So there's always been a, a Mormon church on that site. There was never a BBC building on that site. Would the church have bought surrounding buildings that were former BBC? Well, it, it's possible. Again, the, the story or the narration of the recovery of the film has never really been quite clear on the matter. So it is a possibility that the films themselves were found in a different building by mm. the members of the church in Wandsworth. So although the films may not have been found in the basement of the church in Wandsworth, they may have been found in a different building that the church members were cleaning out, which could have been an ex-BBC building. But it's, it's hard to judge because there's really no mm. sort of way of tracing all that. Although um, there is paperwork that you can find online where there are maps right showing where different bbc departments different bbc buildings were housed in london and it's places right. like television centre riverside ealing studios villiers house etc there's nothing in yeah. wandsworth how curious so if there was a bbc building in wandsworth it's not on the bbc's official map of where the departments and buildings were um, located so it's one of those sort of like you know uh, joining the dots but not really making up a clear picture <laughs> you, just get, you just get a mess so i don't think we'll ever get a, a proper and final answer on 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 that just simply because it's so much time has passed and a lot of people involved in it have you know, moved on or probably aren't even around anymore sure and so what else was found with five and ten there were some more films yeah there was uh, included in the batch of films was some schools programs but there was thousands and thousands of those so there's no way of like researching uh, into what they were there were two episodes of a series called adventure world and yep. an episode of, uh, of the bbc's naval drama called warship yeah. which was on a black and white film print. Now, this series was actually made on Color Pal video. So the fact that a 16mm black and white print of this exists tends to suggest that this was a uh, an audition print that was sent overseas. Sure. Because there's no other reason why a 16mm print of this episode should exist. But funny enough, when the ABC in Australia auditioned Warship in January of 1974, the um, audition team viewed a 16mm film print of it. And this was in the days before the ABC had transitioned into uh, colour broadcasting, which didn't commence until March of 75. And it's and I've seen the paperwork for this. It's clear from their notes that they were interested in the series of Warship, but wanted yeah. to wait until they could get colour episodes. So the black and white 16mm film print of the pilot episode, which is uh, called Hot Pursuit. The episode that was founded by the church uh, was never identified by title, so we don't really know. But the fact that we know that yeah. Australia received a black and white 16mm print of the pilot episode, which they looked at in January of 74, but decided not to go ahead with it until they got the episodes in colour. There's a very good chance that this is the same film print. And then eventually, a couple of years later, 1976, I think it was, the ABC did get a Series 1 and Series 2 in colour, which they auditioned again right. and put, made and purchased the series. Would the BBC have only sent one episode of that out to audition and only to Australia? Well, yeah, because the way, the way it worked was the, the BBC's office in Sydney would contact the ABC and say, these programmes are now available. And included on that list would be Warship. And so the ABC would say, yes, we're interested in this. Can you just send us episode one or episode two, right. I think. So, but the CBC could have done the same thing. In Canada, probably not because the CBC by that point were doing colour anyway. Aha, right. So it's suggestive then that... Pretty much the ABC in Australia were offered all BBC programmes straight away and first. Uh -huh. Because the ABC in Australia was, was the BBC's biggest client. And indeed, if it is that print, it's suggestive that Australia sends back their audition prints. Well, exactly, yeah. So if, if the ABC sent back that episode of Warship and saying, no, we don't want it yet, there's a very good chance that you know, all other film prints that they had to turn away, e.g. Master Plan, would have gone back to source. But also found with the episodes of Adventure World. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Adventure World was another name given to a long-running series called The World About Us. And again, the two episodes that were found uh, were never identified, so we don't really know what episodes they were. But Adventure World was only a very short run. I think it was only like two series during 82, 83. And uh, it was kind of like a, a spin-off from The World About Us, which was aired at a different time slot. Mm. So again, we know that uh, the ABC in Australia did certainly screen the world about us 
but there's no uh-huh. evidence they screened Adventure World. But the thing is, is that the Adventure World episodes were the World About Us ones, but with new titles, if that makes sense. So it's exact, the yep. exact same episodes, they just stuck on a different title sequence. I mean, there's examples of this happening. There's a series called The Undersea World Adventures of Jacques Cousteau. Uh-huh. The exact same episodes are also known as Calypso. They just changed the title. They're having a lot of TV shows they would, and for films. Yeah. They would be given a different title. So in the case of Adventure World, this was a BBC series because it screened on the BBC, but they were just World About Us episodes retitled. So what probably right. happened is that when these films were found by Steve Bryant, he looked up on the BBC database by typing in possibly the, the episode title and then the, sure. the computer spat out Adventure World, whereas these episodes were probably actually The World About Us. Sure. We don't know. And we know that the ABC did screen The World About Us. They didn't screen Adventure World. So again, I'm not drawing, drawing any conclusions here, but these films may have also come from Australia. Sure, but DMP was rejected in 67. Yes. Warship was rejected in 74. Yeah. When was um, Adventure World? Adventure World was 82, 83. But 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 world but world about us um, started in the late sixties. You've got a span of a span of years there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if they yeah. were sent back from Australia, yeah. they would have been sent back separately. But there's no yeah yeah yeah. There's no guarantee that all those films that were found at the Mormon Church were all from the exact same source. We don't know how they got there. There have been various ideas thrown around, like um, jumble sales, or hmm. somebody from the church was a film collector and was storing them in the basement just because he um, yeah, he, he had the key. <laughs> you know, there could be there could be multi. There's a multitude of reasons and ideas as to sort of how the films got to be where they got to be, but the actual truth behind it all, you know, is lost to the mists of time. Okay, John, tell me about episode two. Yeah, um, episode two was returned to the BBC in 2004, I think it was, and it was returned by a guy called Francis Watson, who out of the blue contacted uh, Steve Roberts, uh, saying he's uh, got these two episodes of Doctor Who that he's uh, had in his position since about 1971 or 72. And the background of these was uh, he used to work at Ealing Studios, which was the BBC's film studios in uh, Ealing. <laughs> and yeah. he worked in a department that, I think, I think he was a film editor, but he had access to a, uh, to a building on the studio grounds, which was used to test projection equipment. And apparently right. there were, were these piles of uh, just 16 millimeter films uh, that would be used just as um, surplus stock to run through the machines just to test their, make sure they're working properly. And he just kind of like, oh, I'll, I'll take these, thank you very much. And one of them was episode two of Master Plan and uh, another episode, I think it was part five, I believe, of um, the first Dalek story. So these these were just two random films that were just lying around that he just kind of, um, you know, just half-inched. I hope he checked for more Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> well, they could very well have been, you know, uh, stacks of other film prints uh, just lying there. He just happened to take these two. And then, so, yeah, he found um, Steve Roberts kind of feeling a bit guilty after all these years of having these things and said, do you, do you want them back? And, um, yeah, so uh, now back at the BBC. I suppose you're going to tell me that episode two is most likely the same print of the episode that was rejected by Australia in the 60s. It could very well be. You have to question and wonder why else the film print would exist. The BBC wasn't mm. in the habit of randomly running off film prints willy-nilly because you know, there was a cost involved. Film stock was you know, quite expensive in those days. and there, there was a cost involved in running off a film print. Mm. But also the timing, the timing is quite fortuitous because Watson found the film prints circa 71, 72. Uh, and if, as I previously suggested, the film prints that had been sent to Australia were returned, around 67 there's only a very short window there of, of four years between the film prints um wing, winging their way back to the uk going back to enterprises sitting around enterprises for a short time enterprises may very well have sent some of their film prints to ealing because it's only it's literally just down the road from where uh, villiers house was which is where enterprises sure. was, was located and so ealing had yeah, plenty of room um, possibly to be used as an overflow for keeping prints that maybe came back from overseas that enterprises didn't have a chance to actually process yet so there was certainly a possibility that um, the film prints went from Australia to enterprises to Ealing and were just sitting around not going anywhere because by that point 
there's no point in uh, enterprises trying to sell master pan because they couldn't get a sale to Australia. That affected sales to the other Commonwealth countries, ETC. Yeah, the fact that there's a very short window there of three or four years um, between Australia's rejection and Watson finding these prints. So, yeah, we don't know. There's no way of telling. Mm. Because the thing is, of course, is that because the ABC never took possession of these film prints, they didn't splice on their leaders. Usually the ABC would splice on their own Australian Broadcasting Corporation commission sure. leaders onto their films. This particular film print, and also the ones found at, um, at, at, at the Mormon Church, didn't have any evidence of them being in Australia, which is probably a giveaway, the fact that they were in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it's a warped logic. The lack of any stickers or labels or leaders on them from the ABC is probably proof that they came from Australia because the ABC didn't put any of that stuff on it because they didn't purchase the episodes. Sure. Does that make sense? But if they were, yeah, it does. But also, if they hadn't been in Australia, they wouldn't have put their stuff. Well, on exa it exactly. As I say, it's, it's a very, it's a very warped, a very warped logic there. So the possibility is those, those film prints were the ones that came from Australia because you've really got no other reason why these film prints would exist. It's not like sure. the BBC was running off uh, extra copies in the hope that they can make a sale elsewhere because that just wouldn't have happened. Yeah. But to my untrained eye, the copy of episode two that we have the quality of the print is somewhat better than the quality of episodes 5 and 10. And I've heard it suggested, therefore, that that could be an indication they were from different strikings. Mm, yeah, okay, I'll have to, I'll have to go t take your word for that, because I've looked at these film prints and I can't really see any difference, but then that's uh, neither here nor there. The way that the film recordings were done at the time was, uh, particularly during that period, uh, usually the, the, the season three, is that the, the film recordings being made for BBC Enterprises purposes were being made while the episode was being transmitted. So in other words, while the episode was going out, over BBC One, mm -hmm. a film recorder was set up to record that transmission direct off a screen. And obviously, with Earth Master Plan being a 12 week serial, mm -hmm. these episodes were recorded uh, onto film prints um, over, over that, fr that time frame. Sure. And there were, I don't know how many there were, there were five or six of these tele recording machines. Each one would be tuned differently, they would have to be focused, they would have to be. Uh, yeah, the person operating them would be different, so the film stock would be different, the way the films were eventually developed would be different, so you're going to end up with you know, with variances in the mm. final film recording negative, and also subsequently the prints struck from them. So you're going to get the odd uh, you know, fluctuation um, in these film prints. So you know, again, there's no way of telling for sure, but there's certainly... Um, there is an explanation as to why some films would look better than others, just simply because of the way that they uh, they were actually created in the first place. Sure. And we've seen with Reign of Terror 6, I think, that we talked about previously, that the quality of that recording is really different to the others. It's really zoomed in, and um, I'm told that's due to the whim or the style of the telerecording operator. So sure. you're going to get these odd variations and fluctuations in the in the final outcome, uh, in the final output uh, on on the, the the film recording negatives, simply because of there's a 12 week span with different you know with 12 weeks worth of um, opportunity to have variations. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Opportunities to have variations. Yes. Perfect. And that's it from John Preddle. John, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Now, listeners, if you don't know, uh, John publishes his research on a website called broadcast.org, and that's with a DW in the middle for obvious reasons. And John's kindly agreed to come back in the near future to talk about Nigeria again. Five bonus points for guessing which story. And Reese, you've got a bit more on Francis Watson, haven't you? 
he decided to take the episodes to show at his former university film society. Mm. He thought he could project them for people. And he said they were the only two episodes there. There wasn't a bunch and he handpicked those. It was just those two. That's Day of Armageddon and a suppressed field copy of The Expedition, episode five of The Daleks. And he actually said that the master plan episode was about as good as a 16 millimeter sure. recording got in terms of quality. So why were the films there? Well, near to Ealing Studios was Villiers House, which was the office of BBC Enterprises. And they had small viewing rooms for foreign buyers. Uh, they were maintained by the engineers at Ealing. So it's likely that one of them moved those Doctor Who prints across mm. to Ealing. So Francis Watson, he kept the films at the Film Society for some time, during which somebody moved the films into a different film can and used the original cans for the society's own films. And in the late 80s, a Doctor Who fan found the can for Day of Armageddon in the Film Society archive, ah. but there was an unrelated film inside. They remember it as a film on agricultural farming. Well. And they also recalled that the leader for Day of Armageddon, so that's the piece of film before the episode starts they recalled that the leader for day of armageddon had been spliced onto this unrelated film oh which is strange and presumably this film can hasn't been seen by prominent uh, missing episode researchers anyone since certainly certainly not to my knowledge mm. but it's possible that it's still there a later student at the university from about 2005 has said that they saw the film can in the studios. Gosh. So that's only another 15 years that it needs to survive for it still to be out there now. And who knows what information that can could reveal about when the print was made, where it might have been, because I believe the cans for Gosh. episodes 5 and 10 are long gone. So that's the kind of information we don't have for any Master Plan episodes at the moment. That's fascinating. Because the whole picture here is that in the 1970s, in the UK, existed episodes 2, 3, 4, 5, and 10. And, you know, as complete 16mm film recordings. Now, the assumption here is that these, this is simply a case, I say simply a case, but it's just a case of Australia returning their rejected copy and then various episodes being distributed around storage facilities and then mm. uh, either going walkies or we have them now. And it would be fascinating to have that confirmed. There's a theory around, it's been floated, that if this 2, 5 and 10 are not the Australian return. One thing that's been said is that copies could have been made, film film recordings made, in anticipation of future sales throughout the Commonwealth on the normal sort of routine bicycling route. Any thoughts on that? Definitely. Although we now know in hindsight that sales were dwindling for these stories, at this point, BBC Enterprises probably wouldn't have noticed that because Australia aside, most other countries had only just purchased up to the, the rescue. Sales were still coming in for Marco mm. Polo. So from their perspective, sales were healthy and they had no reason to think that they might slow down. So what would be the advantages of striking prints in anticipation of further sales? Well, you'd have them there ready immediately mm. for if they were requested. But the thing is, the sales process was pretty slow and drawn out, which is the reason why there's an initial five-year window for sales to be made. Uh, just as an example, uh, the ABC was sent prints of the invasion in late 1968. They didn't submit them to the censors until early 1970. Right. So this is something that's happening on a drawn-out timescale. So there doesn't appear to be 
an advantage from having the prints there ready and waiting. And you'd also have to store those prints for all that time. And in the case of Dalek's Master Plan, it's not just Master Plan, it's not just Master Plan and Mission you have to store on the shelf, it's Myth Makers and Galaxy 4 as well, because they were offered as a package. Uh, so you'd have to have all those film prints sitting on the shelf. Villiers House wasn't intended for storage. It was an ad hoc system. They stored films in the basement or just in rooms where they could, but it was not a large scale storage facility. So they don't really want films sitting on the shelves. So there may not be an advantage to having the films there ready, but is there an economic benefit to getting them all made at the same time? Well, let's look at the process by which the films were made. So you make your film recording negative. You send that back for developing. It will come back with a review print. You want to check to see if there are any faults on it. It wouldn't make sense to get multiple prints back first time around in case there were problems with the recording. So they check this viewing print. If it's good, great. Put the print on the shelf. That can be the first sales print. If there are problems, they would use the viewing print as a cutting copy to edit out faults if they could and they would then conform the negative to those edits and I imagine they would request a new print so that they were not sending a print full of splices out for sales because it might split whilst they're running the film for broadcast and you don't want that or alternatively if you couldn't fix the faults by editing, they might request a brand new film recording. These are ways in which there might be multiple prints generated by a process that only results in one sales print. Sure. But let's say they've edited the neg and it will produce a satisfactory sales print. To strike a print from a negative, the lab runs the film through what's called a contact printer, which shines light sure. through the negative onto a new positive film. It's essentially a projector, but it's pulling through two rolls of film, one of which is exposed onto the other. If you want to strike a second print, you have to run the entire film through the printer for a second time. So it's not, there's not really a great benefit to having multiple prints struck in one session because the bulk of the cost is for the film stock and the operating time. So the only advantage you would gain would be you don't have to send the film back and forth to the lab, but it's the BBC. They would have been sending film back and forth from the labs every day. Just chuck it in the van. So it takes up space if you have the film prints there sitting on the shelf for months and it doesn't save you much money to get it printed in anticipation of a future sale. Gosh, Reese, that is both clearly explained I'm really depressing, but thank you so much for that. If you come on again, you're not allowed to be so negative, if you pardon the pun. And so in terms of whether anything will show up again, well, just spelled it out in the 1970s, we know at least five episodes were present in the UK. And if it's from that return batch of films, then I guess it's possible that the other six films could have could have been snuck out of Villiers house or maybe even the film library by the sound of it so okay it's uh now getting on for 20 years since uh episode of dalek's master plan has turned up but i guess it, i guess as we know these prints are around it, it stands as good a chance of being found in a private collection uh, as anything else mm. So that's fascinating, but, but to have that film can might reveal a different narrative. But what if the films that exist aren't the Australian return? Did Australia ever send their films back? And back in February 2014, Australian researcher Damien Shanahan was interviewed by Stephen Shapensky of Radio Free Scaro fame and I've <laughs> they've kindly allowed me to play in that interview now back to the um, your work in finding the censored stuff Damien um, I'll bring it up just because it's in it, it gets discussed a lot it's Dalek's master plan which of course was rejected by the Australian censors 
Uh, is there a record of that ever being shipped back from Australia to the BBC? No. Mm -hmm. It was uh, offered in March 66, mm -hmm. and it took a long time before they abandoned the project. It took over 12 months. Yeah, September then, 67, I want to say, wasn't it? Mm, uh, actually, more recent evidence shows that there's a letter where um, Basil Sands, who was then, uh, Peter Lord was running Enterprises in Sydney at the in 66 and then so halfway through the, the master plan incident um, incident they changed uh -huh. uh, they, that's right they changed the managing director to Basil Sands and then he took over and tried to get the sale so that's partly why it dragged out longer because he wanted to sail Peter Lord had already given up so yes around mid 67 they'd given up um, that held actually back the purchase of a lot of of the following stories then um, myth makers uh, onwards it, it held back you know, and that purchase wasn't made for an extra 12 months mm -hmm. because they were waiting for this one to come through because they wanted it. But it was held in bond. Um, anything that hadn't been sold was held in bond. That doesn't mean that it was um, held outside the ABC. It was held in the film, across from the film library in Bond store. And those film prints had circulated around the ABC, but officially they'd never really entered the country officially. Mm -hmm. And so they were held in bond it was illegal for them to destroy anything that they hadn't purchased and there's no record of a return and so that's why uh, the final resting place is a bit of a mystery the bond store uh, was closed in the mid 80s and the contents were moved up to the vaults at Gore Hill just up the road from the Valletta building mm -hmm. where customs uh, where customs was and then it's believed that the contents from there have been primarily shifted over to Chester Hill at the National Archives and partly at Ultimo. But because they, they weren't bought, they're in a special category and they may well have um, been retained by the film censors uh, along with the clips. I just haven't found any evidence of that yet. So there we go. And thanks to Radio Free Scaro for letting us use that. And so, <laughs> to summarise uh, this situation, as I understand it, basically, the as Damien said, there's no evidence they were sent back. We do have evidence that many episodes were sent back from Australia. That's evidenced in the paperwork. But the <laughs> the particular film store, the Bond store, was subject to a series of mergers of departments, and that's resulted in whatever is in that store isn't readily accessible in part due to secrecy laws in Australia. Now previously I've discussed on other podcasts that one of the supporting arguments for Dalek's Master Plan potentially still being there is that Deep Throat uh, is still there after that was rejected. Now I've had some clarification on that and the case is that and it's searchable on the NAA website, is that Deep Throat 2 was censored and it's the censor clips that still exist in the NAA and are searchable on the website. So that argument no, is no longer valid. Now, we tried in this podcast not to, to talk about rumours, but there's rumours that Dalek's Master Plan was indeed cited uh, in situ some time ago you know in the 90s or at some point like that but as so often happens rumors are born out of speculation based on a handful of known facts and i've also seen comments that the naa store this particular store is in disarray due to neglect lack of labor etc so it's a really great theory we've heard at length during this podcast plenty of reasons why the films would have been sent back examples of other audition prints being sent back and that's very hard to shake off i have had some brief contact with damien in writing and uh, <laughs> i've been desperately trying to get him to to come on and, and be interviewed and hopefully that might happen in the future but as far as he is concerned the matter is not resolved. He hasn't had a definitive yes or no. He's still hoping to get a definitive answer on that. So it's possible, just possible, 
that Dalek's Master Plan exists in entirety, less episode seven, in a forgotten Australian mm. storeroom. Let's hope so. That concludes our <laughs> our look at Dalek's master plan. It was an epic. <laughs> it was epic. It was an epic wait and then an epic conclusion. Let's hope it wasn't an epic waste of time. <laughs> Gavin and Reese, well, thank you so much. And listeners, if you enjoyed that, or even if you didn't enjoy it, <laughs> please do visit Apple Podcasts or Podbean and leave us a, a five-star review if possible and a, and a comment uh, that will help the algorithms find their way please do comment and subscribe if you've listened on youtube and we'll be back next time with paul to look at the massacre open brackets of st Bartholomew's eve close brackets see you next time speak to you next time bye Say bye. 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 Tim. Tim. Gav. Do you like owls? <laughs> Good. Uh Right, let's try starting. This feels very, very rusty. Because I know a cracking owl sanctuary. We've got that recorded, haven't we? So can go on then. <laughs> <laughs> um, bloody hell. I think I've said what I need to say.